Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I am your host, Mike Merrill, and today we are sitting down with the James Benham, the CEO of JB Knowledge. James taught himself to code at an early age, and that helped him spark his entrepreneurial spirit. And after his first year at Texas A&M, James and a partner founded their company, JB Knowledge. JB Knowledge is an information technology services company that specializes in application design and development. Also, electronic data interchange, as well as strategy consulting, mobile solutions, and web development. So in 2018, James launched another company called TerraClaim. It's also a claims management company and also uh, has benchmarking systems. Lastly, James is also a podcast host like myself. And not only does he host one podcast, but he hosts two. Uh, The first one is the Contact Crew, and the other one is the InsureTech Geek podcast. So today we're excited to talk to James about the construction industry and how they are embracing technologies and how those things are uh, laying out across the construction landscape. So hello, James. Welcome to the podcast today. Howdy, howdy. Thanks for having me on. Always good to be on somebody else's podcast other than my own and uh, excited to talk with you today. Yeah, it's a nice switch up, I'm sure, for you. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Great. Well, uh, do you mind just sharing a little bit about your background and how you got Uh, into the positions that you're in? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to a a high school for engineers. And uh, so we had, it was like, uh, if you, if you're old enough to remember the the TV series fame, it was like fame (laughs) for nerds. Uh, And so we, uh, we built a lot of software in high school. And then I went to Texas A&M, the just an absolutely awesome, amazing university in College Station, Texas. And uh, they taught me about business and accounting and Got my master's in business there and then uh, did a couple of internships with a big, uh, big five consulting firm and decided that wasn't my path. And so when I was uh, back in college, I decided to start this company, JB Knowledge, with my dad and one of my high school classmates who is an exchange student uh, from Argentina named Sebastian Costa. And so for 20 years, we've been building software for uh, construction companies and insurance companies. We we built a big product called SmartBid. SmartBid ended up being a yeah. pretty dominant industry player in Invitation to Bid. Um, we, we had about a third of all, all projects flowing through it, um, uh, at one point, uh, sold it three years ago to I square foot construct connect, kept JB knowledge, uh, kept all my engineers and, and we, uh, built a product for certificate of insurance tracking, which is a big problem at GCs and built a product for insurance claims management, which is a problem for larger organizations that self-insure. And, and then we stayed, kept, kept doing uh, construction technology consulting. So that's kind of the path, you know, uh. I, uh, I stayed in College Station, uh, love living there. I'm, I'm married, two kids, uh, two daughters, and uh, I'm a, I, have a, I have like a lot of hobbies. I'm like a compulsive hobbyist. So uh, I'm a pilot and I fly pretty much every week. Uh, all I really think about is flying. Um, and uh, I play the guitar and piano and sing and do all that about every night and play, hang out with my kids, go camping every month. I mean, if it's a, if it's a hobby, I like doing it. And um, I'm really into to tech. Uh, in every way, shape, and form. I, I got hooked, just hook, line, and sinker when I was 11 and got my hands on my first computer and started writing code and, and really haven't looked back since then. And I've been blessed to be surrounded by awesome people. I've got 245 employees now at JB Knowledge, and uh, most of them are engineers, and I've, I've got the world's best business partners. Um, you know, we're, we're fully employee-owned and uh, no outside capital ever. And uh, we've really, really focused on building great companies and I've had a lot of fun doing it. My goodness. When do you sleep? <laughs> Usually five or six hours. Uh, last night was five and a half and that, that was about it. It was between uh, 1230 and uh, 1230 and six. And uh, it was a, it was a short night last night. I'm, I'm on the board of regents of uh, Texas Southern University in Houston and um, down here in Houston and at the Four Seasons right now for uh, for some board meetings and uh, just love education. And so I've been trying to help them for the last seven, seven months. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun, but uh, does get a little tiring. But uh, as they say, you sleep when you die. <laughs> Maybe, right? Yeah. We'll see. 
<laughs> well, good for you. Well, I, I've known you for many years, well over a decade, and I've never known you to be anything different than full of pizzazz and enthusiasm. So I'm, I'm glad you're still maintaining that same love for life and passion. Got to, man. Life's short and then you die. You know, I mean, it's a, uh, I, 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 I joke that I have a carpe diem complex. Uh, my wife says I have FOMO, fear of missing out. And so I just, uh, I like to go get it done and have fun doing it. And, um, you know, the, the world's full of opportunities on where you can spend your time. I try and spend it on areas I think are, are fun. Construction is one of those areas because it's just so rewarding. People are so amazing. Uh, technology can have such a huge impact on safety and health and productivity and profitability that it's, it's proven to be a worthwhile journey for the last, uh, you know, 17 out of the 20 years that I've been really focused in, in, uh, in, in a specific industry vertical. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I love it. And I know uh, within the space, you know, obviously I've been in this space a long time. I was a contractor before, but uh, everybody knows James Benham as Mr. Tech for Construction. Uh, and uh, so I, you know, I, I think uh, I think a lot of people look up to you for that and also look to you for direction and maybe insights into what's coming down the pike. Um, I know you're also very well known for your annual construction technology report. Uh, for the last nine years. So what can you share with the listeners about that report and, and yeah. who's it for? Yeah, we started it. We started it nine years ago because there was really no definitive work. There wasn't a really good work from Gartner or somebody else that would usually produce industry research that we thought was um, good enough for the specificity of what our clients were looking for. And I'll, I'll, mm-hmm. again, we, we're kind of a weird bird uh, as a software company because we have a media group uh, that does the, you know, the contact roadshow, which we do, you know, six of those a year. And then we have the two podcasts and then we have our report. That's our media group. And then we have our, then we, and then we've got our development group, which is huge here. It's, you know, it's, it, it's a couple hundred people. And then uh, we've got our product group. Um, and, and it's, it's been really interesting when we started it because uh, our consulting group was really trying to answer these questions. Like what are contractors using? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what what are they doing? How's how's adoption? And it was really interesting because this is about field uh, to see through the last nine years, the explosion of mobile tech and the number of apps we had to cover, the number of mobile devices, mobile device utilization. So the real the real objective with the report was to give a free report out there that people could download and read and first understand market share, understand what tech they should look at, what apps are popular um, and, and mind you, we survey thousands of companies. So it's not, you, yeah. know, you see a lot of surveys and market research. There are like a hundred companies responding. Right. I mean, our, our average is two to 3000 every year that respond. And so it's a, it's a, it's a big enough market set that, um, that, that it helps people make spending decisions. We also really dive because I have a degree in accounting and spend a lot of time looking at money. Uh, you know, like looking at like what, how's money being utilized. We talk about the percentage of revenue that's spent on IT because it's a really low number in construction, and that's one of the big things that's holding us back. You got to invest before you get return. It's almost right. so, and so that that's part of to answer your question, what the report's about. We're trying to we're trying to get people to get get off of center and really recognize that technology is an investment, not an expense. They'll get their money back. They can become more profitable. And then help them uh, identify which tools they should start with that are pretty easy to implement, that all their peers are implementing, uh, that are delivering return for their peers. Yeah, I love how you said, uh, you know, it's about the money. I, I think one of the things that I always come away with is that there's there's an X factor on those dollars. These are This is sacred money. It's new money. It's different money than just, you know, raising your price. I mean, you're, you're able to leverage that multiple times and grow it rapidly when you have an ROI on, on a technology investment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, technology in general should all have some return allocated to it. Otherwise there's no point in buying it. Right, um, right. Like, why would you do it? I mean, it's, right. I mean, there's, there's no, in business, there's no cool factor. There's no points assigned <laughs> for style really. I mean, right, right. There's one scorecard in business, and it is how much cash does the business generate, right? That's it. That's the, that is the, the compre- – and by the way, it's not gross revenue. You know, right. a, lot, a lot of contractors get, like, fixated on gross revenue in their building volume. And I'm like, that is – it's a nice to have, but it really doesn't indicate how good of a business you are. What, what indicates how good of a business you are is how much cash at the end of the year do you generate every year from your activities that you can then use – either for your own personal enjoyment or further investment, right? Like one of those two, but that's the whole point of a business. I mean, this is capitalism, right? We're not, we're not talking about, you know, 
capunism, which is this this weird hybrid, you know, communism capitalism thing goes on in China. We're not talking we're talking about capitalism, and uh, we're, we're here we're here to 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 drive profit and margin and wages because the beautiful thing is more profitable companies tend to pay more money to their employees too and bigger bonuses. So I mean. Everybody wins, right? Everybody wins right. when you have profitable businesses and low profit businesses have a harder time paying wages and paying bonuses and doing things. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a combination there that you got to be really aware of. Yeah, I love that. So from the 2021 report, is there anything that, that is glaringly obvious that you t- come away with? I'd say, um, well, one of the glaringly obvious things is that spending is really not materially moving north, and and I would like to see it moving north faster. So that that's probably a disappointing side of things that spending just isn't budging off of center, right? Uh, secondly, we are continuing to see a big push into mobility. Right? That's mm-hmm. that is that that wave is not a fad. It, it didn't it didn't die off, right? I mean, you 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 see. Uh, but what we are seeing uh, a desire from contractors to start consolidating some of their mobile solutions. So maybe instead of using 10, they want to use five, you know, so you're seeing some consolidation. Of course, you're seeing consolidation in general in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, but you, you see that too. Um, but, you know, we, when you look at it, they have a desire to consolidate, but really the number of mobile apps that, that each company uses is, is still pretty high, right? They're using five, six, seven mobile apps for a company. Uh, so that's still been pretty popular. The popularity of uh, of mobile devices in general and of connecting the field um and i call it the difference between going paperless and going digital nine years ago we had a lot of companies that were responding to the survey that were trying to go paperless so they were really just creating scanning workflows that allowed for their their field staff and office staff to keep using paper but then scan it in and then route that digital representation of the document which is you know it's a poor substitute for truly going digital Right. Going digital right. means you're going to originate digitally. You're going to log the data digitally. You're going to route and workflow that data digitally. It's never going to get turned into an image. If you, anytime you're routing an image, that's that's paperless, and it, it's really a, a, a '90s solution to a 2021 problem. So that's certainly something else that we saw from the uh, from the report. Yeah, it's half a step better, but it's certainly not the the be all end all what you yeah. want. It's better than routing physical paper. Okay, it is, it is, but there's still a whole bunch of mistakes that happen on the rekeying. There's mistakes that happen on OCRing or scanning or routing. You know, there's a lot of room for error, and that's the that's the real problem. And you can't capture all the context you can with digital origination. So we're trying to get people moved into originating data digitally. Right, take the take the photo with your phone, fill out some data, auto tag it, add GPS locations. You know, put it into structured or unstructured data that can be structured later. I mean, there's a, there's a real goal there. And it's ideally to to do away with paper forms, paper plans, paper specs. I mean, those th- those are really problematic. I mean, this industry has thrived on unstructured data, and it would be nice to structure more of the data, right? Because then we can we can more easily do things with it, like you know, make better decisions, be more profitable. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. You mentioned five to seven apps. It's it's ironic because we did a we did a survey report uh, a year ago also, and that was the exact number. It was between five and seven apps is the average number yep. the companies are used to collect job site data. So you're yep. spot on with our findings as well. Yeah, so. yeah, and, and and you know so, some are okay with it. I mean, hell, I, I use. I use a lot of apps. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, you look at my phone and you're going, "Oh God, Benham, how do you t- how do you how do you track that many apps?" I mean, I, I've got I've got I don't know, a couple hundred on here, right? But but right. The, the reality is, I, I I love I love tying things into my phone. I mean, I really do. My oh, kid, I just got a new I just I just got a new washing machine from Maytag. All right, damn thing's got an app, and I. <laughs> And, and I never thought I'd love it, but Mike, I love the damn thing. It's amazing. Really? Yeah, it's awesome because because I can I can load clothes in there. Like you know, if you like workout clothes and that kind of stuff, but you don't want them you want them washed the next day, so not sitting in there getting moldy. Or so I can schedule when it's. I can load them in and go on my phone and schedule when it starts. And then the really cool thing is it does a push notification to me when they're done. I mean, you know, I, I think it's important as as nerds and as 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 technologists. Mm-hmm that in our personal lives, we really try to go digital because it gives us a lot of ideas about what's possible in the work world. And yet that, that, that phrase is kind of consumerization of IT, right? We, we ideally, people, and this is happening a lot more, right? People are so digital in their personal lives. They step into work and they're going, my gosh, I'm sticking back 15 years. I mean, yeah. Mike, I drive a self-driving Cadillac, right? Like my car drives me to Houston, 
Uh, so mm-hmm. why is my construction equipment still requiring manual input? I mean, right. you know, and, and, and it's affordable now. You can get a Tesla Model 3 really reasonably with great autopilot feature functionality. So why is it so cheap to get that level of automation on a personal level and so accessible and it's not, in a, in a in a business environment, and that's that's what a lot of the students that I've taught over the last five years um, are saying is that hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm doing using all these digital tools, and I go to the workforce, and it's like time warp. Ten years ago, yeah. step and back to the eighties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just not it's not cool, and they're not liking it, and that's that's you know where where they're trying to push change. Yeah, you you bring up a great point. The the rising generation that are they're in college right now and in high school. I mean, my junior high daughter. Just, just, uh, just finishing up ninth grade. I mean, she's been doing online learning, and with COVID and everything else, of course, everything was digital, right? They've had, uh, you know, school issued tablets for years now. So, yeah, if you try and hand a new, a new employee just fresh out of college or even high school uh, a piece of paper, they're they're not even gonna know what to do with it, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit challenging. I mean, my uh, my you know. I'm in Texas, you know, land of the free. And so uh, we, we, we were face to face school all year, a little different, but, but we, we, uh, um, uh, my, my kid's school uses Google Chromebooks for everything. Right. So they had to have a Chromebook. They use Google classroom. Everything's digital. I can log in and check the assignments. I mean, totally, totally game, total game changer. And, and then you, you step into your average company. It's like, man, where, where's all this centralization at? Right. So it's uh it, it's it's something we got to be aware of, right? You can't just say I hate the the thing where people are well, thank God I'm retiring and not to deal with this. I mean, what a, what a terrible way to approach that, right? I mean, uh, um, it you 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 really got to. Uh, I I think the, it, it's helpful to embrace change, not for the sake of change, uh, but for the sake of results and productivity and profitability. Um, and uh, you know the examples are are plenty. Yeah. So for the last, so you're, you're actually, this is your 20th year, right? At JB knowledge. Is that right? Just turned 20 April 16th this year. I, 20 years ago, I drove from my dorm room in my 1995 uh, Ford Mustang to the Brazos County courthouse and filed the paperwork. And uh, you know, it's uh, we, we've managed to survive nine 11 and the Oh eight economic crisis and COVID and all this other garbage that, yeah. that uh, easily put a lot of the gray hair on my head that I've got. And uh, it's uh, it, it's been quite, quite a ride, but uh, yeah, um, we we uh, just turned 20 as a company, and of course our products, uh, Smart Compliance uh, uh, and 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 Terra Claim, are a little younger than that. But yeah, it's been a been, been a fun 20 years. Yeah. So in that, I mean, you mentioned mobility. That's the obvious one. But what else has changed in Contech in in those last two decades for you from your well, seat? Yeah, mobility huge. I remember the first laptop I got was a year into business. The first year I just had a desktop computer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then then we got into laptops. Uh, the Okay, in general, I got into construction tech, uh, and I, th- I think I said 17 years, it was 15 years ago. I got into insurance se- uh, 17 years ago. Uh, 2006, I jumped into construct tech with smart bid and the bidding system, and I saw a boatload of paper. I mean, just reams and reams and reams of paper being used, a whole bunch of, pr- bunch of printing and shipping plan files, which is just dead now. So that completely went away, right? Um, which was good. I mean, it was like a billion dollar revenue line for UPS and FedEx to print and ship plan files. I mean, it was cr- crazy, wow. a crazy, you see about all that waste. Uh, it, it's just waste. Uh, don't feel sorry for FedEx and UPS. They're doing great uh, online e-commerce has done wonderful things. For, they don't need to print and ship plant files for us. Um, so certainly uh, the, the disappearance of from a lot of, not, uh, not, not everybody, but from a lot of people's job sites, uh, the boat, the majority of their papers, just, they still use some, but not nearly as much. Uh, the advent of of smartphones, right? So 2007 yeah. was when the iPhone came out, and it really wasn't the first smartphone. You don't don't forget right. about that. Like I had a Palm Pilot back in the day, and then you know the early stages of Android. But but Apple was the first one to really nail it down and get it really right, and get everybody really excited and market and sell the hell out of it. Uh, that changed. Uh, you know that was the year after I started SmartBid, and uh, so we 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 were the we, I, I want to say we were one of the first three construction apps in the in the app store, but I don't really know if that's true. I know that we were like number one on the list at one point of construction yeah. apps was smart bid. And you think about it, it was for estimators. They really didn't have to have a mobile app because they were largely at their desk. And right. so, so you've seen mobile uh, apps, apps become a big deal. Um, automation has completely changed construction. Um, 
drones and sensors, right? So the miniaturization of chips, how chips become really inexpensive, semiconductors become really inexpensive, sensors and data are really pervasive. And then 4G and then now 5G has had a massive impact on construction because now we can actually get real bandwidth to the job site fairly easily, which has a, has a, has a sea change of an impact on construction because now you're able to pull off a whole lot more tech like beyond, beyond, beyond line of sight drones. Well, dr- drones in general, like half of people we survey have drones. Yeah, that's a huge change. You have your own aerial fleet over the job right. site that you can take aerial images of anytime you want. And you can produce, you know, photogrammetry and you combine drones with photogrammetry. And and that's a huge change as well. Right. Because they're able to measure and count and do all kinds of other existing condition assessments. So all of those technologies came along. And then you have the ERP players are slowly getting in the line. You know, it, it took a while they had to do some acquisitions and bring some other players in. The big guys had to start some new companies, you know, so you saw like Jonas and CMIC start their own cl- equivalent cloud products. So all of that has come along pretty nicely. Guys like Coins in the UK built a new platform that's all web mobile based. And so they've really come along and they've gotten with the times. And, uh, and then, of course, big thing that changed is the amount of venture capital and money flowing into fun new ideas went up exponentially. So you have a lot more choices, almost too many choices right. as a contractor. Yeah, that's why we're seeing the consolidation again, right? We're, we're yeah. seeing them get gobbled up again. Classic so. cycle, classic cycle, classic cycle of, uh, you know, fund, innovate, create, sell, acquire, consolidate. Then now, now we're going to be back into the split off and start again. So that's exciting that the drone thing is something else I've noticed too. And I remember it's been about 10 years ago. I was in a insurance claims adjusters office, a, a big company and they had developed, and it was like top secret. They had this miniature helicopter. I mean, it, I think they spent like $30,000 building this thing. It had like a weed, weed eater engine on it or something. I mean, it, it was nuts. And, and it was top secret, right, to get something that could actually hover above a roof and take measurements. But uh, it's amazing that you can order it on Amazon and have one tomorrow if you're, you know, a 10-employee roofer in Chicago. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like from your survey that half of the half of the companies have invested in those. So R- that's roughly, a huge roughly, yeah, half of half of the ones that we survey have have invested in some type of drone. Now, many of them are underutilizing it. They're not using enough apps. Right. They're using like the base factory apps for drones. And thankfully, DJI has really DJI, who of course dominated mm-hmm. the drone space for construction, has really got on the ball with their factory applications. Uh, but but still. Uh, you know, my, my personal favorite is Drone Deploy. I mean, there's a lot of really good construction drone apps out there that uh, that make a big difference. So what? So you mentioned, uh, you know, there are companies that are jumping on board, a lot of the larger ones, a lot of the ones that you've surveyed. What is the hesitancy behind the ones that still aren't jumping on board yet? They just don't see it. I mean, when it comes down to it and I have conversations with them, they just don't. They think that the return numbers, the ROI is is uh, fictional. Uh, they're, they're skeptical mm-hmm. about the ROI. They're carrying a lot of risk already, and there's already so many things that could go wrong on a job site. And I respect this. This is it's a hard it's hard to be a contractor. There's a lot of ways to lose money, right? I mean, being a contractor is like playing a game of a thousand and one ways to go bankrupt. I mean, it's 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 challenging. It's it's a high risk and sometimes high reward, sometimes low reward, but it's definitely a high risk, low margin business that many people feel they have to make up on volume, and so that's pretty challenging and so you introduce this concept of change uh and more than it, it gets really it gets really tough for them to stomach um a a massive uh, a massive change and i respect that and understand but it doesn't make it any less frustrating for me and everyone else in this t- in the tech sector um when they cite a lot of the same old reasons uh right. you know and and the, the reality is at the end of the day they'll be willing and i'm a pilot so i like to fly mm-hmm. uh, all of my neighbors at the airport are all contractors. All mm. They have really big, expensive airplanes, and they don't like spending money on tech. Now, why is that? They're willing to drop $3 million on a new King Air, which has marginal incremental value to their productivity. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll say it has a ton of incremental value, and it has, right. it has value, but not for the dollars they have to burn to, to, to run it, operate it, buy it, acquire it, et cetera. And, and then they'll, they'll underinvest in IT, which has the opportunity to give them enough money to buy a much bigger jet Take that for the plane. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like you, you, you really, it's like you, you're putting the cart before the horse in some of these right. things because you understand a plane, a plane gets you to your job site faster and you can easily look, anybody can justify anything. 
All right. Mm -hmm. If a business owner wants to justify something, if they want to lie to themselves long enough, they can do it. And and one thing my dad told me to do a long time ago in in business, because he's my personal mentor in business, always has been. um, You know, he said, James, no matter what you do, don't lie to yourself. Like Mm -hmm. he goes, just you can you cannot you can you can choose to not uh, disclose everything to everybody else. But at the end of the day, don't lie to yourself and pretend you're profitable when you're not. Don't pretend that things are good when they're not. Don't pretend like you're a you're a proactive investor. I've seen so many construction CEOs stand up and say, "Man, we're a proactive tech forward company. We're going to innovate." Blah 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 blah. And you go talk to their employees, like, "Man, that guy won't even approve an iPad purchase." And right. it's you know, and it's because and the, and then they say they really they, some of them some of them some of the more dangerous ones <clears throat> will make really uh, snide comments about you know mm-hmm. IT guys. And so they, what they do is they denigrate the IT department, and and it's kind of like classic jock behavior. You know, look at the nerd over there. And what they do is they give everyone permission to just dog on technology because the reality is most people are so busy and they work so hard in construction because construction is filled with hardworking people that they don't want a lot of them. It's a, it's a lot to ask them to change their process and rethink things. And so if you give them permission, if you give them a moral license to just deny or dog anything they new that comes up, then they'll take it because they got a lot on their plate. And, Which is really just shooting themselves in the foot, right? Absolutely. I mean, and look, why why do our margins suck? We're the we're the bottom. We're the right. bottom. We're also the industry that has that has that has uh, improved productivity the least of all industries, and we're at the bottom of margin. And so, why? Well, it, it's it, isn't it obvious? It, it isn't it obvious. There are other high risk industries that make far larger margins because they've invested heavily in technology, people, and process, and they've gotten the results. And so, I, I, it, it's 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 a it's 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 tough because I I always want to balance and walk the line of respecting the road contractors have to walk and respecting the risk they have to take. You know, but but at the same time, not giving everybody a free pass just to to you know, to dog the the stuff they don't like or understand simply because they don't want to change. And, and, and look, the desire to not change is very strong in many, like, you know, the force, yeah. the force is strong with you, Luke. <laughs> like I, I, I'm only watching the Mandalorian, which I love. And I'm not a star Wars guy. I'm a star Trek guy, but Mandalorian is amazing. It's pretty and, good. <laughs> you know, and the force is good with some, the force is strong with some and it's not with others. Yeah, I think it, it is interesting. It is, it is, you know, you're in the same position that I am where you're, you know, technology driven, technology facing, you're trying to help. Yep. And it's exhausting trying to convince some of these same companies. I mean, I, like you, I can think of a dozen huge companies that we've been talking to for over a decade that are still in their own way on some of these things. And I, it just, it doesn't make any sense at all to me. Well, it doesn't make sense when their peers have made so much more money than them. Right. Yeah. And um, have reduced their risk profile so much because there's two sides of the coin. It's, you know, becoming more productive and also becoming safer and less risky, which, you know, that's a, that's a big part of contractor losses is, is insurance and risk management claims. And so it's two sides of the coin. Um, and so I, my hope has been for them to, to catch it and understand that they have to invest to get return, they have to take risk, get reward. They've got to in, invest in technology and people in process and uh, adopt, ad- you know, learn to experiment, you know. But, of course, walk in the line with not experimenting too much because, you know, burn your people, right? right? There's always, it's always a balancing act. And so I don't, I don't want to paint it with, you know, just gross generalizations because every, every right. and we do a lot of consulting with construction companies and every single company is a, is kind of a different grab bag. And and so you just also got to respect that too. Yeah. I think the, the fear of change seems to be the, the largest thing that we run into. And we, we say it all the time and we can back it up with statistics. We, we rarely lose to a competitive solution. It's usually no decision or delayed decision or, you know, we're going to get to it later. Something else became a priority. Yeah, absolutely. So you've talked uh, many times about the three B's of construction. What can you share about those and how do they relate to contact solutions? Is that ringing a bell to you? Big data, big business and blockchain? Yeah, you know, it's not big business. So it was, yeah, big, big data. And then I think BIM and blockchain were the threes that, I, that the three that I talked about, right? Yeah, BIM. Sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Big data is really exciting 
the insurance sector, which is the other half of my business that I spend a lot of time on as InsureTech, they are really learning how to leverage big data in a, in a massive profitable way because they're using big data for automating, underwriting, and claims handling decisions for, for, for re dramatically reducing the amount of forms they ask people to fill out because they can automatically populate the data on properties and people and equipment and, and because they're using public records and they're using, you know, uh, d data aggregation repositories. I mean, it's really impressive what is going on in InsureTech. We got to take a big lesson from them because we require way too much manual entry of stuff. I'm going to give you an itty bitty weedy little tiny example. All right, just one, okay. itty, just itty, one, ten little examples. Address. <laughs> it's it, it's, it, it's ad, just addresses, right? So back in the day, which was like a Wednesday, you had to you just type a whole address in. Okay, it takes you, you know, uh, let's say it takes you 30 seconds to really fully type a whole address in because getting a right. street number, street name, and then a, if you're in Utah. Then go right. look, Lord help you figuring out how that addressing system works, right? So <laughs> I still can't figure out how streets are addressed in Salt Lake City. I'm told it's very logical, but but I still haven't figured it out. But you still it's got a grid to, system. It's, it's a, a grid. System. It's a grid system, but New York grid system is easier for me than Utah's grid system. So I'm just going to say that. All right. So then I so then you got you got the uh, you, you got to figure you type the whole address out to city, state, zip, country, you know, county. All right, then, then, then we end up with these zip code databases. So you type in the zip code, auto populates city state zip. Now, uh, because we have ridiculously good mapping data, I mean, ridiculously good, like, right, like yeah. amazing how good our mapping systems are. You can use the Google Maps API and you just start typing the first part of the address mm -hmm. and then it auto completes. It cuts a 30 second transaction down to about five. Yep. And that's a wonderful example uh, of, of how of how much you can leverage big data. And that's that's just the, the, the little thin, thin, tiny little sliver off the top. Uh, then when you're talking about property data, let's say you're keying in data on a property and you want to know all the details about that property, what's near that property. There's a bunch of databases you can tap into to automatically pull that data into your project systems so you don't have to manually key all this stuff in. And you can make better decisions. Uh, so big data is really, really exciting. It's a lot of potential. Um, also in analytics, once you once you start aggregating all the data across all of your different verticals, you can start making better decisions. You know, database decisions, not not emotional decisions. Right. Okay. When I, when I started looking at, at work comp claims, which which happened a lot in construction, I found that my emotions told me one thing that comorbidity factors like diabetic, overweight, smoker were going to contribute to a worker having a tough time recovering. And, and in fact, it, it, it contributed to a cost of the claim. Mm -hmm. The reality is once you started peeling through the data, their lawyer contributed as much as any other factor. Interesting. Yeah. It was it, not just the fact that they had a lawyer, which lawyer they had contributed wow. heavily to how much that work comp claim is going to cost. And that I didn't discover that until I really started peeling through millions of records on work comp claim incidents. So that's big data. Now, BIM is, uh, there's been a lot of mandates in the UK, the level two mandate. There's been a lot of mandates, not a lot of mandates here in the US, mm -hmm. um, but, but BIM continues to have the opportunity to revolutionize the way things are built and the quality that they're built because you want to find the mistakes before you start building. And there's no better way to clash detect and find mistakes than by doing fully coordinated multi-trade BIM. All right, so I absolutely still stand by BIM uh, be, being a, the, have, having the ability. Now I talk about blockchain and here's the interesting thing. Um, these are all underlying tools. So what, what's actually happening with blockchain is really interesting because it's being implemented in a lot of places now, but they're just not right. talking about it anymore. It's all under the covers, behind the all, scenes, right? All under the covers. They they originally had it over the covers. They were actually using right. it as part of their product marketing. And everybody's like, I don't know. They, they, they just, well, unfortunately, they immediately assumed, uh, associated blockchain with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah. And, and that, that became a big problem. And so people are still using blockchain, but they're using it under the covers to accomplish the same thing without really talking about it. So, mm -hmm. so you know, it, it is, um, you know, big data blockchain, BIM, BI is something that was like a fourth B that, that we do a lot of talking about. And that's just business intelligence, really getting people used to not just analyzing data in Excel, but moving into a tool like Power BI or Tableau, because that's allowing them to make much better non-emotional decisions. And uh, we use we use Metabase uh, ourselves. It's an open okay. 
It's an open source BI tool system, and we love it. it really helps us analyze our enterprise data. So those those actually that's the, actually the fourth B is is BI. Um, but they're, 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 those still should be watched. Now blockchain, man, it's in the news all the time because they're talking about all the different cryptos, which are all on blockchains, right? It's either on Ethereum or whatever whatever you're on. Um, you know, but we did. I, I just don't think they're going to talk about it as much, even though it's going to be heavily used. Interesting. Yeah, I, I love like uh, you know the way you phrase that. It's the underlying technology that's driving these things. Yep. And uh, and that's back to contractors need to have confidence and trust and get on board with the rest of planet Earth, <laughs> the other businesses out there that are leveraging technology to be more efficient, as opposed to avoiding it or trying to, you know, see what they can do to keep away from yeah. some of those changes that, that are maybe uncomfortable. Pretty but, much, man. Pretty much. I mean, it's the way it is, right? But wildly profitable, right? Yes. Can be. Have the potential to be. So what so when when we talk about the word artificial intelligence, I mean it used to be, you know, people think of iRobot or other things. What 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 does that mean to you when you hear AI when it comes to con, uh, construction technology? Um, so is, we're not in general AI. We're not there yet. That's Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Because I, I don't think about that. I think about the specific forms of AI, like machine learning, that are really transforming individual skills. Natural language processing, which is being used for NLP search, like, uh, like Dato, or like what Pipe is doing with ripping apart spec books. So there's a lot of machine learning tools being used. SmartVid is using uh, computer vision, which is another subset of AI. So I'm just really excited that all these little specialty areas inside of AI, like machine learning and deep learning, uh, computer vision and NLP are all being utilized now uh, at commercialized products that are mainstream. I mean, they're, they're definitively mainstream. And so when you look at when you when you when you look at all those tools that I just mentioned, all mainstream tools, heavily adopted, people are using them every day. We're auto tagging. We're doing an index search. We're doing contextual search. We're looking for intent. In, uh, and I mean, there's awesome things you can do uh, ar ar around AI. And and then, of course, you see um, like the, the mapping and decision making trees, like, again, other parts of deep learning and machine learning being used, like spot the spot, the you know, the. Um, uh, the you know the robot from Boston Dynamics uh, right. is, is is using some very specific forms of ML to to get around. So uh, exciting outcomes. The most exciting outcome from AI is that it's actually mainstream. Products are actually using it. It is real. It's not fake. It's not just a giant if then conditional statement. Um, it, it is it is real stuff. What about uh, what about digital printing? Uh, have you are you seeing that used more widely yet or commercialized? You mean three D printing? Yeah, three D printing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, okay, slowly but surely. Uh, small scale three D printing. Yes, like even formwork contractors are using it to test their formwork before they go make it. Um, Fastbrick is one of my favorites with the Hadrian X robot out of Australia. They they're getting certification. They're passing engineering tests. They're printing with blocks instead of with uh, with you know uh, with concrete, and uh, they're being successful. Uh, their government is you know stamping and sealing it that's that's the really big hurdle for 3d printing and you look at like icon out of austin i mean they're they're hell of fire they're on fire right and they're 3d yeah. printing houses so 3d printing is real dubai said like 25 of their percent of their buildings in the next like four years are gonna have to be 3d printed i mean they're they're laying out like super aggressive 3d printing targets and then um apis core did a, did a big 3d house 3d printing project in russia in the middle of winter under a tent i mean some crazy stuff is happening with 3d printing uh, most important thing in 3D printing is that government bodies are starting to approve it for people to actually live in it, which was the major step because we started seeing 3D printing of houses out of China like eight, nine, ten years ago. Right. But you're you're finally starting to see uh, countries that have really tight building standards say, "Hey, this this works. You can you, people can live in it." Yeah, they're they're efficient and they're now safe. They're deemed safe. Deemed safe. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see yeah. how that all works out. <laughs> Well, lots of great things. Obviously, you're you're a great advocate for construction and technology and the adoption of opportunity. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you think is important for people to to hear and understand about construction technology and the impacts that it can have? No, I, I, I'll just leave you with this. Just you know, enjoy the ride and geek out. Become a tinkerer. You know, go 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 to Best Buy and buy stuff and then return it if you don't like it. I mean, just discover the love of playing with things. Right? Just it, it is. It's really part of my DNA and part of my team's DNA that we just geek out on what we do. And 
I ask my clients to do the same thing, right? Whatever it is you do, uh, geek out on it. Uh, it's, uh, life is too short to be boring. Life is too short to be meaningless. And the beautiful thing about improvement is I believe improvement gives purpose. You know, it allows you to, to look back and see what you accomplished. Even if nobody else knows, you will always know, you know, and that's, that's the, that's the thing that I, I think as humans, we got to be in the experience business. Um, and, uh, cause no one can take those away from you. And, and that's, what's so fun about innovating and changing and adopting technology is you can look back and you can see what you, what you got done. And so, uh, and, and you got to discover the joy of being a tinkerer. I mean, when you're a kid, I mean, you break up a new Lego box. I still build Lego. I still do. Right. I just rebuilt all the Lego from my childhood. Uh, my, my daughter, my 11 year old, I just finished like a 5,000 piece Lego piano that actually functions. Uh, wow. it is still a blast to make. So just, uh, if you got to play with technology toys or you got to go back to Lego or can, or connects or whatever you got to do to, to rediscover that inside, uh, I encourage people to do it. And, uh, and just recognize that in business, the ultimate goal is to generate cash. And, uh, and this, this is one of the things that can have such a, a massive impact on that. I love that. So, so more on a personal level, James, what is one of your uh, superpowers or your strengths that you feel like you really can lean on that helps drive you? Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm fairly quick at figuring things out. And that, that has uh, served me well as a consultant. It served me well as a software developer. I can generally step in and figure things out pretty quickly. And I'm a fairly quick learner. Now, that's, that's also because I, I just never stop learning. It's one of the reasons I love being a region at Texas Southern, because I can help people learn. I love teaching. I love learning. Um, I, I, really, I really enjoy the process of educating. And I think great companies are great teaching companies, too. And so I, I think that's probably uh, one of the things that I've been better at over the last 20 years that's really helped me with my team um and uh has 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 helped me to um enjoy the day more and help my people to to upgrade more so i think that's been a, a lot of fun i really uh i really enjoy teaching really enjoy leading our folks and i really enjoy trying to to get people excited uh cuz you know m motivation is this funny thing it's it's sometimes it's hard to come across and sometimes it's easy to lose and, uh, and, and anytime you can motivate a group, you can, you know, that's what leadership is. Leadership is motivating ordinary people to do extraordinary things, you know, and it's, uh, it's an, an important part of, uh, of life and business. So I, I think that's probably, probably one of the things I'm, I'm better at. Yeah. I love that. I, I, I believe the same. I, I think that great leaders are, are people that empower others to implement their good ideas, not, not just to come up with all the good ones on their own. Right. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So, so tell me this, what is, uh, what's a big challenge that you've overcome in, in business and how did you solve that? Oh, we, the, 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 well, I'll say this to, to wrap our, our conversation up. The, the biggest challenge was we were hitting the, the ceiling in our business several years ago and mm. uh, we didn't have an actual methodology we followed. And so I discovered and found this, this methodology called EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. And it allowed me to put a really defined way of achieving vision, traction, and health, and, and, and fixing our meetings. We have awesome meetings now. Fixing our planning. We have planning documents. We follow them. Fixing our process. We have process, and we follow it. I stopped flying by the seat of my pants. I started running our business on a process, and it was like just putting really high-octane fuel in the engine. It started performing so much better. We started having so much more fun. My chief operating officer, Sebastian, and I, who's just my right-hand man, uh, started getting along a lot better. And so that was a huge issue. We were, we were stressed out. We were burnt out. The wheels were falling off seven years ago and really getting serious about implementing a process. EOS isn't the only one, but it's my favorite, eosworldwide.com. I have nothing to do with EOS. I'm not an implementer, but it changed my life. It changed my business. It fixed the biggest business problem I had. And by the way, my personal life made it a lot better too because I was, a, I was able to not, not be so stressed all the time. And I was able to put a system in place and delegate and elevate and, and really trust my people. And so that's, that's by far the biggest challenge we had in business that we were able to, to tackle with a, with, a, with a process. And it was a lot of change and some technology and a whole lot of people, right? It was the same thing. People process technology uh, and, and it uh, completely revolutionized our company. I love that. What a, what a great tribute. And we'll be sure to link that in the show notes so yeah. that 
listeners can check that out. And I'm, I'm interested personally as well. Yes. So. And hire, hire an implementer. I hired, a, I hired the world's best implementer. He's an Alabama grad, Ken DeWitt. Uh, but hmm. there's, there's over 250 implementers of EOS now. Hire one, pay them the money. It's worth every penny you pay them. Uh, it, it, uh, we made the money back tenfold. It was, uh, it was, it was well worth it. Love that. That's fantastic. So last thing. So what is one takeaway that you want the listeners to come away with from our conversation today? Uh, embrace change. Don't fight it. Uh, don't embrace change for the sake of change, but embrace change for what it is, uh, the potential to dramatically improve your life and your business. Well said. Well, thank you, my friend. I've, I've sure enjoyed our conversation today. Looking forward to connecting with you again in the future and maintaining this relationship on technology for construction. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you. Appreciate your business. And uh, let's uh, let's go geek out. OK, <laughs> sounds good. Right. Thank you. Thank you to the listeners today for listening to the podcast with James and I. If you enjoyed our conversation and we're able to gain some insights and some things that you can implement in your business, please share this episode with your friends and colleagues. We also love those five star rating and reviews. Of course, those help us to continue to bring valuable guests like James on and grow our podcast platform. So. Again, our goal is not only to help you improve in business, but in life.